Part one of Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Robert Louis Stevenson by Gilbert Keith Chesterton and William Robertson Nicole. Part one The Personality and Style of Robert Louis Stevenson by William Robertson Nicole as the years pass they disengage the virtue of a writer and decide whether or not he has force enough to live will stevenson live undoubtedly he is far more secure of immortality than many very popular writers the sale of his books may not be great and he may even disappear from the marts of literature now and then but he will always be revived and it may turn out that his reputation may wear as well as that of charles lamb for he engages his readers by the double gift of personality and style the personality of stevenson is strangely arresting in the first place it was a double personality in his journey to the savannas he reflects that every one of us travels about with a donkey in his strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde the donkey becomes a devil every jekyll is haunted by his hide somebody said that the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde showed stevenson as poe with the addition of a moral sense critics may differ as to the exact literary value of the famous little book but as an expression of stevenson's deepest thought about life it will retain its interest he was not content to dwell in a world where the lines are drawn clear where the sheep are separated from the goats he would have a foot in both worlds content to dwell neither wholly with the sheep nor wholly with the goats no doubt his ruling interest was in ethical problems and he could be stern in his moral judgments as for example in his discussion of the character of burns he was by nature and training religious something of the shorter catechist his earliest publication was a defense of the covenanters and in his last days he established close friendship with the samoan missionaries he was by no means orthodox either in ethics or in religion much as he wrote on conduct there were certain subjects and these the most difficult on which he never spoke out on love for example and all that goes with it it is quite certain that he never spoke his full mind to the public at least another very striking quality in his personality was his fortitude he was simply the bravest of men now and then as in his letter to george meredith he lets us see under what disabling conditions he fought his battle human beings in a world like this are naturally drawn to one who suffers and will not let himself be mastered or corrupted by suffering they do not care for the prosperous dominant athletic rich and long-lived man they may conjecture indeed that behind all the bravery there is much hidden pain but if it is not revealed to them they cannot be sure they love charles lamb for the manner in which he went through his trial and they love him none the less because he was sometimes overborne because on occasions he stumbled and fell charlotte bronte was an example of fortitude as remarkable as stevenson but she was not brave after the same manner she allowed the clouds to thicken over her life and make it gray stevenson sometimes found himself in the dust but he recovered and rose up to speak fresh words of cheer he took thankfully and eagerly whatever life had to offer him in the way of affection of kindness of admiration nor did he ever in any trouble lose his belief that the heart of things was kind in the face of all obstacle he went steadily on with his work nor did he ever allow himself to fall below the best that he could do an example so touching so rare so admirable is a reinforcement which weary humanity cannot spare with these qualities and indeed as their natural result stevenson had a rare courtesy he was in the words of the old hebrew song lovely and pleasant 
or rather as robertson smith translated it lovely and winsome in all his bearings to men of all kinds so long as they did not fall under the condemnation of his moral judgment with a personality so rich stevenson had the power of communicating himself he could reveal his personality without egotism without offence many writers of charming individuality cannot show themselves in their books there is as little of themselves in their novels as there would be in a treatise on mathematics if they could write it perhaps less there have been mathematicians like augustus de morgan who could put humor and personality into a book on geometry but stevenson had not only a personality he had a style his golden gift of words can never be denied he may sometimes have been too precious but the power of writing as he could write is so uncommon that he must always stand with a very few we believe that stevenson's style is largely an expression of his courtesy he wished as a matter of mere politeness and good will to express himself as well as he could in fact it was this courtesy that led him to his famous paradox about the end of art his characterization of the artist as the son of joy the french have a romantic evasion for one employment and call its practitioners the daughters of joy the artist is of the same family he is of the sons of joy chooses his trade to please himself gains his livelihood by pleasing others and has parted with something of the sterner dignity of man the theory that all art is decoration cannot be seriously considered it was certainly not true of stevenson's art he wished to please but he had other and higher ends he had to satisfy his exacting conscience and he obeyed its demands sincerely and righteously and to the utmost of his power but he was too good a man to be satisfied even with that milton put into all his work the most passionate labor but he did not believe that pleasure was the end of art nor would he have been satisfied by complying with his conscience he had a message to deliver and he delivered it in the most effective forms at his command stevenson had his message too and uttered it memorably if the message had to be put in a few words they would be these good my soul be brave he was bold enough to call tennyson a son of joy but he would have assented with all his soul to tennyson's lines and here the singer for his art not all in vain may plead the song that nerves the nation's heart is in itself a deed william robertson nicole end of part one Part two of Robert Louis Stevenson by Gilbert Keith Chesterton and William Robertson Nicole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two The Characteristics of Robert Louis Stevenson by Gilbert Keith Chesterton. All things and all men are underrated, much by others, especially by themselves and men grow tired of men just as they do of green grass so that they have to seek for greener carnations all great men possess in themselves the qualities which will certainly lay them open to censure and diminishment but these inevitable deficiencies in the greatness of great men vary in the widest degree of variety stevenson is open to a particularly subtle a particularly effective and a particularly unjust disparagement the advantage of great men like blake or browning or walt whitman is that they did not observe the niceties of technical literature the far greater disadvantage of stevenson is that he did because he had a conscience about small matters in art he is conceived not to have had an imagination about big ones it is assumed by some that he must have been a bad architect and the only reason that they can assign is that he was a good workman the mistake which has given rise to this conception is one that has much to answer for in numerous departments of modern art literature religion philosophy and politics 
the supreme and splendid characteristic of stevenson was his levity and his levity was the flower of a hundred grave philosophies the strong man is always light the weak man is always heavy a swift and casual agility is the mark of bodily strength a humane levity is the mark of spiritual strength a thoroughly strong man swinging a sledgehammer can tap the top of an eggshell a weaker man swinging a sledgehammer will break the table on which it stands into pieces also if he is a very weak man he will be proud of having broken the table and call himself a strong man dowered with the destructive power of an imperial race this is superficially speaking the peculiar interest of stevenson he had what may be called a perfect mental athleticism which enabled him to leap from crag to crag and to trust himself anywhere and upon any question his splendid quality as an essayist and controversialist was that he could always recover his weapon he was not like the average swashbuckler of the current parties tugged at the tail of his own sword this is what tends for example to make him stand out so well beside his unhappy friend mr henley whose true and unquestionable affection has lately taken so bitter and feminine a form mr henley an admirable poet and critic is nevertheless the man par excellence who breaks the table instead of tapping the egg in his recent article on stevenson he entirely misses this peculiar and supreme point about his subject he there indulged in a very emotional remonstrance against the reverence almost universally paid to the physical misfortunes of his celebrated friend if stevenson was a stricken man he said are we not all stricken men and he proceeded to call up the images of the poor and sick and of their stoicism under their misfortunes if sentimentalism be defined as the permitting of an emotional movement to cloud a clear intellectual distinction this most assuredly is sentimentalism for it would be impossible more completely to misunderstand the real nature of the cult of the courage of stevenson the reason that stevenson has been selected out of the whole of suffering humanity as the type of this more modern and occult martyrdom is a very simple one it is not that he merely contrived like any other man of reasonable manliness to support pain and limitation without whimpering or committing suicide or taking to drink in that sense of course we are all stricken men and we are all stoics the ground of stevenson's particular fascination in this matter was that he was the exponent and the successful exponent not merely of negative manliness but of a positive and lyric gaiety this wounded soldier did not merely refrain from groans he gave forth instead a war song so juvenile and inspiriting that thousands of men without a scratch went back into the battle this cripple did not merely bear his own burdens but those of thousands of contemporary men no one can feel anything but the most inexpressible kind of reverence for the patience of the asthmatic charwoman or the consumptive tailor's assistant still the charwoman does not write as triplex nor the tailor the child's garden of verses their stoicism is magnificent but it is stoicism but stevenson did not face his troubles as a stoic he faced them as an epicurean he practiced with an austere triumph that terrible asceticism of frivolity which is so much more difficult than the asceticism of gloom his resignation can only be called an active and uproarious resignation it was not merely self-sufficing it was infectious his triumph was not that he went through his misfortunes without becoming a cynic or a poltroon but that he went through his misfortunes and emerged quite exceptionally cheerful and reasonable and courteous quite exceptionally light-hearted and liberal-minded his triumph was in other words that he went through his misfortunes and did not become like mr henley there is one aspect of this matter in particular 
which it is well to put somewhat more clearly before ourselves this triumph of stevenson's over his physical disadvantages is commonly spoken of with reference only to the elements of joy and faith and what may be called the new and essential virtue of cosmic courage but as a matter of fact the peculiarly interesting detachment of stevenson from his own body is exhibited in a quite equally striking way in its purely intellectual aspect apart from any moral qualities stevenson was characterized by a certain airy wisdom a certain light and cool rationality which is very rare and very difficult indeed to those who are greatly thwarted or tormented in life it is possible to find an invalid capable of the work of a strong man but it is very rare to find an invalid capable of the idleness of a strong man it is possible to find an invalid who has the faith which removes mountains but not easy to find an invalid who has the faith that puts up with pessimists it may not be impossible or even unusual for a man to lie on his back in a sick bed in a dark room and be an optimist but it is very unusual indeed for a man to lie on his back on a sick bed in a dark room and be a reasonable optimist and that is what stevenson almost alone of modern optimists succeeded in being the faith of stevenson like that of a great number of very sane men was founded on what is called a paradox the paradox that existence was splendid because it was to all outward appearance desperate paradox so far from being a modern and fanciful matter is inherent in all the great hypotheses of humanity the athanasian creed for example the supreme testimony of catholic christianity sparkles with paradox like a modern society comedy thus in the same manner scientific philosophy tells us that finite space is unthinkable and infinite space is unthinkable thus the most influential modern metaphysician hegel declares without hesitation when the last rag of theology is abandoned and the last point of philosophy passed that existence is the same as non-existence thus the brilliant author of lady windermere's fan in the electric glare of modernity finds that life is much too important to be taken seriously thus tertullian in the first ages of faith said credo quia impossibili we must not therefore be immediately repelled by this paradoxical character of stevenson's optimism or imagine for a moment that it was merely a part of that artistic foppery or faddling hedonism with which he has been ridiculously credited his optimism was one which so far from dwelling upon those flowers and sunbeams which form the stock and trade of conventional optimism took a peculiar pleasure in the contemplation of skulls and cudgels and gallows it is one thing to be the kind of optimist who can divert his mind from personal suffering by dreaming of the face of an angel and quite another thing to be the kind of optimist who can divert it by dreaming of the foul fat face of long john silver and this faith of his had a very definite and a very original philosophical purport other men have justified existence because it was a harmony he justified it because it was a battle because it was an inspiring and melodious discord he appealed to a certain set of facts which lie far deeper than any logic the great paradoxes of the soul for the singular fact is that the spirit of man is in reality depressed by all the things which logically speaking should encourage it and encouraged by all the things which logically speaking should depress it nothing for example can be conceived more really dispiriting than that rationalistic explanation of pain which conceives it as a thing laid by providence upon the worst people nothing on the other hand can be conceived as more exalting and reassuring than that great mystical doctrine which teaches that pain is a thing laid by providence upon the best 
we can accept the agony of heroes while we revolt against the agony of culprits we can all endure to regard pain when it is mysterious our deepest nature protests against it the moment that it is rational this doctrine that the best man suffers most is of course the supreme doctrine of christianity millions have found not merely an elevating but a soothing story in the undeserved sufferings of christ had the sufferings been deserved we should all have been pessimists stevenson's great ethical and philosophical value lies in the fact that he realized this great paradox that life becomes more fascinating the darker it grows that life is worth living only so far as it is difficult to live the more steadfastly and gloomily men clung to their sinister visions of duty the more in his eyes they swelled the chorus of the praise of things he was an optimist because to him everything was heroic and nothing more heroic than the pessimist to stevenson the optimist belong the most frightful epigrams of pessimism it was he who said that this planet on which we live was more drenched with blood animal and vegetable than a pirate ship it was he who said that man was a disease of the agglutinated dust and his supreme position and his supreme difference from all common optimists is merely this that all common optimists say that life is glorious in spite of these things but he said that all life was glorious because of them he discovered that a battle is more comforting than a truce he discovered the same great fact which was discovered by a man so fantastically different from him that the mere name of him may raise a legitimate laugh general booth he discovered that is to say that religious evolution might tend at last to the discovery that the peace given in the churches was less attractive to the religious spirit than the war promised outside that for one man who wanted to be comforted a hundred wanted to be stirred that men even ordinary men wanted in the last resort not life or death but drums it may reasonably be said that of all outrageous comparisons one of the most curious must be this between the old evangelical despot and enthusiast and the elegant and almost hedonistic man of letters but these far-fetched comparisons are infinitely the sanest for they remind us of the sanest of all conceptions the unity of things a splendid and pathetic prince of india living in far-off eons came to many of the same conceptions as a rather dingy german professor in the nineteenth century for there are many essential resemblances between buddha and schopenhauer and if any one should urge that lapse of time might produce mere imitation it is easy to point out that the same great theory of evolution was pronounced simultaneously by darwin who became so grim a rationalist that he ceased even to care for the arts and by wallace who has become so fiery a spiritualist that he yearns after astrology and table rapping men of the most widely divergent types are connected by these invisible cords across the world and stevenson was essentially a colonel in the salvation army he believed that is to say in making religion a military affair his militarism of course needs to be carefully understood it was considered entirely from the point of view of the person fighting it had none of that evil pleasure in contemplating the killed and wounded in realizing the agonies of the vanquished which has been turned by some modern writers into an art a literary sin which though only painted in black ink on white paper is far worse than the mere sin of murder stevenson's militarism was as free from all the mere poetry of conquest and dominion as the militarism of an actual common soldier it was mainly that is to say a poetry of watches and parades and campfires he knew he was in the hosts of the lord he did not trouble much about the enemy here is his own resemblance to that church militant 
which secure only in its own rectitude wages war upon the nameless thing which has tormented and bewildered us from the beginning of the world of course this stevensonian view of war suggests in itself that other question touching which so much has been written about him the subject of childishness and the child it is true of course that the splendid infantile character of stevenson's mind saved him from any evil arising from his militarism a child can hit his nurse hard with a wooden sword without being an aesthete of violence he may enjoy a hard whack but he need not enjoy the color harmonies of black and blue as they are presented in a bruise it is undoubtedly the truth of course that stevenson's interest in this fighting side of human nature was mainly childish that is to say mainly subjective he thought of the whole matter in the primary colors of poetic simplicity he said with splendid gusto in one of his finest letters shall we never taste blood but he did not really want blood he wanted crimson lake but of course in the case of so light and elusive a figure as stevenson even the terms which have been most definitely attached to him tend to become misleading and inadequate and the terms childlike or childish true as they are down to a very fundamental truth are yet the origin of a certain confusion one of the greatest errors in existing literary philosophy is that of confusing the child with the boy many great moral teachers beginning with jesus christ have perceived the profound philosophical importance of the child the child sees everything freshly and fully as we advance in life it is true that we see things in some degree less and less that we are afflicted spiritually and morally with the myopia of the student but the problem of the boy is essentially different from that of the child the boy represents the earliest growth of the earthly unmanageable qualities poetic still but not quite so simple or so universal the child enjoys the plain picture of the world the boy wants the secret the end of the story the child wishes to dance in the sun but the boy wishes to sail after buried treasure the child enjoys a flower and the boy a mechanical engine and the finest and most peculiar work of stevenson is rather that he was the first writer to treat seriously and poetically the aesthetic instincts of the boy he celebrated the toy gun rather than the rattle around the child and his rattle there has gathered a splendid service of literature and art hans christian and charles kingsley and george macdonald and walter crane and kate greenaway and a list of celebrities a mile long bring their splendid gifts to the christening but the tragedy of the helpless infant if it be a male infant girls are quite a different matter is simply this that having been fed on literature and art as fine in its way as shelley and turner up to the age of seven he feels within him new impulses and interests growing a hunger for action and knowledge for fighting and discovery for the witchery of facts and the wild poetry of geography and then he is suddenly dropped with a crash out of literature and can read nothing but jack valiant among the indians for in the whole scene there is only one book which is at once literature like hans anderson and yet a book for boys and not for children and its name is treasure island g k chesterton end of part two part three of robert louis stevenson by gilbert keith chesterton and william robertson nicole this librivox recording is in the public domain part three home from the hill poem by william robert nicole home from the hill by william robertson nicole home is the sailor home from the sea and the hunter home from the hill robert louis stevenson let the weary body lie where he chose its grave neath the wide and starry sky by the southern wave 
while the island holds her trust and the hill keeps faith through the watches that divide the long night of death but the spirit free from thrall now goes forth of these to its birthright and inherits other lands and seas we shall find him when we seek him in an older home by the hills and streams of childhood tis his weird to roam in the fields and woods we hear him laugh and sing and sigh or where by the northern breakers sea-birds troop and cry or where over lonely moorlands winter winds fly fleet or by sunny graves he hearkens voices low and sweet we have lost him we have found him mother he was fain nimbly to retrace his footsteps take his life again to the breast that first had warmed it to the tried and true he has come our well-beloved scotland back to you end of part three Part Four of Robert Louis Stevenson by Gilbert Keith Chesterton and William Robertson Nicole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Four Biographical Note Robert Louis Stevenson. Robert Louis Stevenson by W. E. Henley. Thin legged, thin chested, slight, unspeakably, neat footed, and weak fingered in his face lean large boned curved of beak and touched with race bold lipped rich tinted mutable as the sea the brown eyes radiant with vivacity there shines a brilliant and romantic grace a spirit intense and rare with trace on trace of passion and impudence and energy robert louis stevenson only son of thomas stevenson civil engineer was born on november thirteenth eighteen fifty at number eight howard place edinburgh the house was one of a row of unpretentious stone buildings situated just north of the water of leith when lewis reached the age of two and a half a removal was made to a more commodious dwelling in imberleith terrace but this proving unsuitable to the child's delicate health the family settled at number seventeen harriet row which continued to be their edinburgh home for thirty years two other houses were closely connected with the pleasant memories of stevenson's youth swanston cottage the country residence of his parents and collington manse the abode of his maternal grandfather the situation and history of the former he described in picturesque notes on edinburgh indeed the cottage and its garden have been immortalized by stevenson both in prose and in verse upon the main slope of the pentlands a bouquet of old trees stands round a white farmhouse and from a neighboring dell you can see smoke rising and leaves rustling in the breeze straight above the hills climb a thousand feet into the air the neighborhood about the time of lambs is clamorous with the bleating of flocks and you will be awakened in the gray of early summer mornings by the barking of a dog or the voice of a shepherd shouting to the echoes this with the hamlet lying behind unseen is swanston but it was at collington that stevenson passed the happiest days of his childhood out of my reminiscences of life in that dear place all the morbid and painful elements have disappeared he wrote i can recall nothing but sunshiny weather that was my golden age et ego in arcadia vivi in memories and portraits he drew a vivid picture of the manse it was a place at that time like no other the garden cut into provinces by a great hedge of beech and overlooked by the church and the terrace of the churchyard where the tombstones were thick and after nightfall spunkies might be seen to dance at least by children flower pots lying warm in sunshine laurels and the great yew making elsewhere a pleasing horror of shade the smell of water rising from all round with an added tang of paper mills 
the sound of water everywhere and the sound of mills the wheel and the dam singing their alternate strain the birds from every bush and from every corner of the overhanging woods pealing out their notes till the air throbbed with them and in the midst of all this the man's it was in the same essay that stevenson described his grandfather the rev lewis balfour minister of collington as of singular simplicity of nature unemotional and hating the display of what he felt standing contented on the old ways a lover of his life and innocent habits to the end now i often wonder he added later what i have inherited from this old minister i must suppose indeed that he was fond of preaching sermons and so am i though i never heard it maintained that either of us loved to hear them of his father stevenson wrote also in memories and portraits he was a man of a somewhat antique strain with a blended sternness and softness that was wholly scottish and at first somewhat bewildering with a profound essential melancholy of disposition and what often accompanies it the most humorous geniality in company shrewd and childish passionately attached passionately prejudiced a man of many extremes many faults of temper and no very stable foothold for himself among life's troubles on the other hand there is no descriptive sketch of stevenson's mother from his pen a want probably accounted for by the fact that she survived him in person she was tall and graceful her vivacity and brightness were most attractive and some idea of her undaunted energy and spirit may be gathered from mr cope cornford's robert louis stevenson in which he says of mrs thomas stevenson at past sixty after a lifetime of conventional edinburgh this lady broke up the house in Elliot row removed herself and her belongings to apia learned to ride barebacked and to go barefooted and to look on the life at Velima and the life of Tositale's native friends with equal gusto and intelligence. Stevenson was fond of calling himself a tramp and a gypsy, and that he could do so with justice was owing to the fact that his mother was Margaret Balfour. Another important factor in his early life was the devotion of his nurse, Alison Cunningham, Cummy, as he invariably called her, whose care during his ailing childhood did so much both to preserve his life and foster his love of tales and poetry and of whom until his death he thought with the utmost constancy of affection my dear old nurse he wrote to her and you know there is nothing a man can say nearer his heart except his mother or his wife my dear old nurse god will make good to you all the good that you have done and mercifully forgive you all the evil in his nurse's possession there remains a treasured album containing a series of photographs of robert louis stevenson dating from babyhood onwards the first as an infant on his mother's knee the second at the age of twenty months and again at four years old with bright dark eyes wide apart and stiff curls framing his face in the next taken at the age of six his hair is cropped to a man-like shortness his hands have lost their baby podginess and are nervous long-fingered he has a whip in his grasp which falls slackly down as if toys were not in his line and he looks pensively ahead a few years later he was photographed with his father on whose shoulder one hand is resting the other being tucked boyishly into his pocket stevenson calls himself ugly in his student days writes mr bangden but i think this is a term that never at any time fitted him certainly to him as a boy about fourteen with the creed which he propounded to me that at sixteen one was a man it would not apply in body stevenson was assuredly badly set up his limbs were long and lean and spidery and his chest flat so as almost to suggest some malnutrition such sharp angles and corners did his joints make under his clothes 
but in his face this was belied his brow was oval and full over soft brown eyes that seemed already to have drunk the sunlight under southern vines the whole face had a tendency to an oval madonna-like type but about the mouth and in the mirthful mocking light of the eyes there lingered ever a ready autolycus roguery that rather suggested the sly god hermes masquerading as a mortal the eyes were always genial however gaily the lights danced in them but about the mouth there was something a little tricksy and mocking as of a spirit that already peeped behind the scenes of life's pageant and more than guessed its unrealities three and a half years were employed by stevenson in preparation for the profession of civil engineer he spent the winter and sometimes the summer sessions at the university of edinburgh in eighteen seventy one however he informed his father of his inclination to follow literary pursuits engineering was given up forthwith and it was arranged that he should study for the scottish bar to which he was called in july eighteen seventy five in the photograph on page thirteen you have him bewigged as robert louis stevenson advocate and there is the suspicion of a playful duplicity in the would-be wisdom framed face it was at this period that stevenson came in close companionship with sir walter simpson the baronet who was also studying law sir walter figured as the cigarette to stevenson's arethusa in the inland voyage from the days of his toy theatre onwards robert louis stevenson had always taken an intense interest in matters theatrical and with another of his friends fleming jenkin he took part in numerous amateur performances the portrait in fancy dress was no doubt the outcome of this favourite pursuit on his return with sir walter simpson from the inland voyage stevenson became acquainted with mrs osborne who was later to become his wife the marriage took place in san francisco in the spring of eighteen eighty in the hope of finding a climate suited to his health stevenson went abroad at the close of eighteen eighty two and settled for a time at hiers where by the end of march eighteen eighty three he was established in a house of his own the chalet la solitude this was a picturesque cottage built in the swiss manner on the slope of the hill just above the town and here for some eight or nine months he enjoyed the happiest period of his life we all dwell together and make fortunes in the loveliest house you ever saw with a garden like a fairy story and a view like a classical landscape he wrote little well it is not large but it is eden and beulah and the delectable mountains and el dorado and the hesperidian isles and bimini year after year the struggle against ill health was increasing and in eighteen eighty seven stevenson's uncle dr george balfour insisted on a complete change of climate and the second voyage to america was undertaken in the following june began the south sea cruises which after three years of wandering culminated in the period of settled residence at samoa while in the south seas in eighteen eighty nine stevenson paid a visit to molokai the leper settlement in the hawaiian islands which resulted in his famous letter to dr hyde in defence of father damien who died a month previous to his arrival the place as regards scenery is grand gloomy and bleak he wrote describing the settlement mighty mountain walls descending sheer along the whole face of the island into a sea unusually deep the front of the mountain ivied and furred with clinging forests one viridescent cliff about half way from east to west the low bare stony promontory edged in between the cliff and the ocean the two little towns kalawao and kalaapapa seated on either side of it as bare almost as bathing machines upon a beach and the population gorgons and chimeras dire about three miles inland on the hills above apia the chief town of upulu in the samoan group 
the stevensons made their home in november eighteen ninety the house itself was erected on a clearing of some three hundred acres between two streams from the westernmost of which the steep side of vera mountain covered with forest rose to a height of thirteen hundred feet above the sea from this stream and its four tributaries the estate was called by lima the samoan name for five waters this is a hard and interesting and beautiful life that we lead now he wrote our place is in a deep cleft of Vaya Mountains, some 600 feet above the sea, embowered in forest, which is our strangling enemy, and which we combat with axes and dollars. The house was built of wood throughout, painted a dark green outside, with a red roof of corrugated iron. The building was finely enlarged in compatibility with the requirements of the family, and consisted after december eighteen ninety two of three rooms bath storeroom and cellars below with five bedrooms and library upstairs on the ground floor a veranda twelve feet deep ran in front of the whole house and along one side of it the chief feature of the interior was the large hall my house is a great place he added on another occasion we have a hall fifty feet long with a great redwood stair ascending from it where we dine in state the two posts of the big staircase were guarded by a couple of burmese gilded idols stevenson gave many glimpses of his life at bailima in his letters to mr sidney colvin the following extract seems typical i know pleasure still pleasure with a thousand faces and none perfect a thousand tongues all broken a thousand hands and all of them with scratching nails high among these i place the delight of weeding out here alone by the garrulous water under the silence of the high wood broken by incongruous sounds of birds and take my life all through look at it fore and back and upside down though i would very fain change myself i would not change my circumstances his favorite exercise was riding and he was an excellent horseman jack the new zealand pony which he bought in eighteen ninety carried him well i do not say my jack is anything extraordinary he is only an island horse and the profane might call him a punch and his face is like a donkey's and natives have ridden him and he has no mouth in consequence and occasionally shies but his merits are equally surprising and i don't think i should ever have known jack's merits if i had not been riding up of late on moonless nights it was stevenson's great delight to keep open house at bailima and especially to organize any festivity in which the natives could share an example of this hospitality was the entertainment given to the band of the Katunla on September 12, 1893. I got leave from Captain Bigford to have the band of the Katunla come up, and they came, 14 of them, with drum, fife, cymbals, and bugles, blue jackets, white caps, and smiling faces. The house was all decorated with scented greenery above and below. We had not only our nine outdoor workers, but a contract party that we took out in charity to pay their war fine. The band, besides, as it came up the mountain, had collected a following of children by the way, and we had a picking of Samoan ladies to receive them. They played to us, they danced, they sang, they tumbled. Stevenson's influence with the natives was probably as great as that of any white resident in the islands. He was certainly respected by them as a whole, and by many he was beloved. Indeed, his friendship with Timbiknoka, the king of Apamama, whose character is described in the South Seas, forms an important episode in that volume. He is the Napoleon of the group poet tyrant altogether a man of mark i got power is his favorite word it interlards his conversation another chief with whom stevenson was in great sympathy was matafaya the rebel king who was defeated and banished in august eighteen ninety three upon outbreak of war in the island 
Matafa he believed to be the one man of governing capacity among the native chiefs, and it was his desire that the power should conciliate rather than crush him. Matafa is the nearest thing to a hero in my history, and really a fine fellow, plenty of sense, and the most dignified, quiet, gentle manners. During Stevenson's four years' residence in Samoa, no fewer than eight British men of war entered the harbor, and at the time of the bombardment of the rebels of Atua, HMS Curasat was more often stationed at Apia than any of the others. We have in port the model warship of Great Britain, he wrote, describing a cruise to Manua. She is called the Curasat a ship that I would guarantee to go anywhere it was possible for men to go and accomplish anything it was permitted man to attempt. After taking up his abode at Vailima, Stevenson only twice returned to the world of populous cities. In the early part of 1893, he spent several weeks in Sydney where he visited his friend, the Honorable B. R. Wise in september of the same year he made a voyage to honolulu on his return to epia in november he was gratified by the mark of esteem and gratitude extended to him by the native chiefs who cleared dug and completed the road to vailima till then a mere track which could only be traversed in dry weather by wagons or by a buggy goods being taken to the house by two New Zealand pack horses. On the estate itself, the route lay by a lane of limes, and this was cut off by the Ala Loto Alofa, or Road of the Loving Heart, which the chiefs cut to commemorate Stevenson's kindness to them during their imprisonment by the European powers. Considering the great love of Tusitala in his loving care of us in our distress in the prison, we have therefore prepared a splendid gift. It shall never be muddy, it shall endure forever, this road that we have dug. Upon its completion, a great kava drinking was held. There was a solemn returning of thanks, and Stevenson gave an address which was his best and most outspoken utterance to the people of Samoa. Only two months later, on December 3, 1894, Stevenson died. He was in his 45th year. The Union Jack, which flew over the house, was hauled down and placed over the body as it lay in the hall, where he had spent some of the most delightful hours of his life. His devoted Samoans cut an almost perpendicular pathway to the top of the Mount Inveria, which he had designed as his last resting place. Thither, with almost Herculean labors, they bore him, and decked his grave with costly presents, of the most valuable and highly prized mats. There he lies, by a strange, almost ironic fate, under other stars than ours driven forth not thank god by neglect nor by any injustice of man but by the scourge of sickness and threat of death and the unfriendliness of his native skies into his beautiful exile amid tropic seas he draws and long will draw perhaps while the language lasts with a strange tenderness the hearts of men to that far and lonely samoan mount on the tombstone, built of great blocks of cement, are carved the Scotch thistle and the native ante, and between them is a bronze plate bearing the following inscription, his own requiem. Under the wide and starry sky, dig the grave and let me die. Glad did I live and gladly die, and I laid me down with a will. This be the verse you grave for me, here he lies where he longed to be, home is the sailor home from the sea and the hunter home from the hill end of part four end of robert louis stevenson by gilbert keith chesterton and william robertson nicole